Easy money, black money, old style, new style. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Voodoo Room, Mr. John McCall. Where do we start? We've already been down the road of talking about Malta and the Phoenicians, which is kind of not much to do with music, is it? No, but that's okay. I want to continue where we left off. Okay, well, sure. I always used to joke, well, let's talk about Joe for a second, just to get that out of the way, because, you know, Joe and I have had a falling out. You want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Well, what happened was he invited me and Molly, you know, I work with Molly uh, Pinnock, Molly in the Prohibition, to do a little support for him at Memo, right? We were getting on really well. And at the last minute, he kind of stiffed me by saying, no, they all said you can't use the piano, but you know what Joe's like. If it's his show, he's the boss, right? So he stiffed me. So basically, we, we broke up badly over a disagreement. And the disagreement goes like this, Pete. I thought that you should help a mate when they're down on their luck and needing a gig in this time of COVID. You should help them out and chip in and not let them fall. Joe strongly disagreed with that. And that's where we had a little falling out. <laughs> Is that right? He, he strongly that's, disagreed. Strongly disagreed that you should help a mate out when they're down on their luck. Man, that's not good. Yeah. That's not good. He disagreed that that was a principle. But anyway, this is very dangerous territory. And we can no, 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 like no, no, no. We've got That's that out it. of the way. That's it. But it's got nothing to do with me, Johnny. And this is a separate thing altogether. But okay. I appreciate giving me a little bit of background about your situation with my older brother. Because, as you know, we've all had our uh, rough and tumble times with him, you know. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's all right. We were great friends and we played together for about eight years, I think I was with the Sorrows and did, I I co-produced four albums with him and we actually had a great time. We've got a great sort of rapport and a great sense of humour. At the moment, we're having a little break. There's probably like a little decade or so, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. the, 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 the small things in life, mate, you shouldn't let them get in, get in front of uh, good relationships. I know that's sometimes difficult, especially in music, uh, because I've been in that yeah. situation where I've lived with oh. musicians and, uh, you know, for 10 years and you think you've got a great bond and stuff and, and just things build up over time. You know how it is. And uh, you get to a yeah, point absolutely. where you just don't want to have anything to do with, any, any, with that, you know, anybody anymore, you know, and it's hard because it's... Mu- it's all, you know, musicians have traditionally in bands, there's always been a classic falling out, hasn't there? There's been uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon and, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, just all, all bands, you know. So, and mm. you can, I mean, it's a pretty intense thing to be in a band, I think, isn't it, Johnny? Because you're travelling, you're, you're, you know, you're doing all yeah. that sort of stuff. I sort of found it was funny because doing all that travelling into rugby, it's like, Basically, the tour goes like this. You fly off to somewhere like Townsville, you drive for three hours to get to a gig, you do a sound check, have a meal, do the gig, go to sleep, wake up at five in the morning and drive three hours back to the airport. And that three hours in the Taraga, you can imagine you can do other work, but you know, some, some people want to have their own thing. I've got my own thing, like I've got my Black Money project and the things I like to write and the things I like to do. And you always think, yeah, well, I'll take my laptop, put on the headphones and work on that. But you rarely do that. It's very, very much harder than it seems to be in a Tarago at five in the morning and working on your project. Everyone's asking you to navigate, you might have to drive. And so it doesn't really, when you work for someone else, and you know, Joe's like a, a well known figure, or Ross Wilson, I worked with for 10 years too. When you work with them, you are kind of behold, they are buying your time. And your, your other stuff suffers in some ways too, you know. But then you've got to make a buck. So it's, it's very, very tricky, the whole the music business. I've done um, everything from, you know, I'm a founding member of the David Chesworth Ensemble, which is like a contemporary classical group. And that's very art house, um, minimalist sort of ensemble, violin, cello, two percussionists. So we played all over the world, Slovenia, France. We've been played Bang on a Can. Um, festival, which is kind of a high, like with Philip Glass and people like that turn up to watch. So I've done that. I was, I played the Logies for 10 years, which makes me kind of a session player with Chong Lib. So I might have been playing contemporary classical music with, um, or, you know, kind of art house music with the chambermaid, or, uh, chambermaid opera at the same time as doing the Logies. And I just think it's like, I feel a bit like a, um, a troubadour. In fact, 
I don't have much of a political stance on things. An interesting one time I was playing a gig with my old mate Alistair McNabb at the Grand Prix in the morning and at the same time the next, on, so that was Saturday, on Sunday, I played at the protest against the Grand Prix with Jane Clifton. You know, so <laughs> these are things you don't want to talk. I mean, I don't know what to uh, say about that. Does it, what I mean, does that mean? Well, it just means... You're a, you're a mercenary. I'm absolute mercenary. Well, that's what I've been accused of being, and probably <laughs> rightly so. It's just, um, <clears throat> you know, it's very hard. You follow the money. I I'm not aligned with any kind of institution or any sort of job. I'm an absolute freelancer. Yeah. And even in this time, which is really uncertain, I feel a little bit like what's new in the sense that everything's uncertain. I've recently, um, I was fortunate enough, I got a little business grant from um, Banyuil Council for a few bits and pieces and I've got myself a new, I like to sort of sit around and program all sorts of things and write new songs. The project I'm working on at the moment is, I've, I'm making an album with Molly, uh, Molly and the Prohibition, that act is, absolutely traditional Bessie Smith songs with we're trying to get as an authentic kind of backing as we can for the Bessie Smith repertoire. And then after I've recorded that, um, and I've done a few of these little mock-ups, uh, mash-ups, I um, take Molly's vocals and then get people to remix it or remix some myself and do complete remixes of the Bessie Smith thing with those brilliant lyrics. So I want to bring out a two album CD, a two album set of the traditional band recorded and then the, and then the remixes. And I'm looking for five or six remixes. Um, and this will be 1920s trad jazz and then trying to appeal to a kind of a whole different audience with the remixes. That's what I'm working on at the moment. And I've got all the, I finally got, like for instance, I've got a fantastic piano sound, particularly when I get my two stereo mics up there now, I can record a great piano at home when, it, when the piano's in tune, which it is at the moment. And I've got that new Apollo Twin X, but not to get into too much into the gear and stuff, but yeah, it's really, I've kind of finally, through this period, tried to get at least correct weight in, in the gear at home. So, you know, if anybody needs piano tracks record, I can do that sort of thing. And I do, I've been doing a few lessons by Zoom. Well, when I did the gig last week, Peter, <laughs> I, I uh, put together the PA, carried it on a trolley upstairs, set up the PA at, at two, Went and played a little set at four, then played the set with Molly, then waited until everybody had gone and then packed up the PA. I did the whole, that's one, two, three, that's six things. How far do you want me to go? Well, that, that, well that's um, essentially one thing, but you're doing it, you know what I mean? You're doing it for yourself, yeah. you know what I mean? But um, hold on a second. Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's obviously having to multitask. So you're doing the mixing as well while you're playing? Well, it's just piano and vocal. This yeah. I wouldn't dare do mixing yeah. it at a higher level, yeah. but it's still, yeah. you know, it's still a, a thing you've got to get right. You don't have mic leads that don't work. You've got to have microphone. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's so much to remember. That's right, there is. That's what I've found because in the past, of course, I'd get a guy to come and do that for three, four hundred bucks, a little vocal PA. You know, that's like we're all getting about the same, yeah. you know, for a party in a way. And But it is it is a task, you know, and it's sort of on top of having to play, work out the set list and stuff. Yeah, it's kind of a, that's the job, you know. And you're still... So w when did you finish up with Vic, uh, Vicar Bull doing the... Um... What was the last gig I did? The last big gig was, um, was it the 29th of 2nd of March, I think? Where that was, was the Hamer Hall. Oh, that right. was the At Last. Uh, you know, yeah, At Last, Jones that's right. Story, yeah. Hall. Yeah. And we did that with um, six strings. So that was kind of a beautiful kind of way to go out. But Vicar really wants to focus on the Vicar and Linda thing, which is kind of going from strength to strength at the moment. So that we did have had about 10 years of that last. And I don't think she, just between you and me and nobody else, you know, and everybody else, I don't think she particularly wants to pursue it hugely, you know, as, as a, as at least not as a central fixture in her you know, career. We'll probably do some stuff together. Was that was that your idea, that concept, or...? Not really. Originally, the idea came from um, Moira Bennett and Bill Livings, but Simon Myers approached me at a show which was like um, Barassi, the musical. Oh, yeah. Um, Paul Norton had done the music over at the Athenaeum and said, you know, we're trying to do this thing. And I said, Vicar? What about Vicar? I said, he go, and he said, yeah, that was my thought. So everybody thought Vicar straight away. So Simon, Moira... 
um, and Bill Livings, who kind of, you know, tossed it around. It was a bit of a mutual thing. And I was just brought in to arrange the music and put together the band. But as it went along, you know, I created the mu like the musical kind of interludes and some of the moves, you know, because music's so integral to a show. You can say, well, just arrange the music and, but, you, there are moves in theatre shows and they depend on the music. So we all sort of chip in our two bobs worth, you know, to create a show, including Vicar. So um, there's narrative and stuff like that. It's a bit more... When you, have, when you have narrative, then you have lights, then you have different microphones on stage, things get a little bit more... Complicated. Yeah, and then you throw six strings on top mm. and... So did, yeah. you, did you tour with that? Did you go to, like, to Edinburgh and all those sort of festivals? And Yes, well, we did... Um, we did two weeks in the UK as a reconnaissance and then in 2018 we did five weeks in the UK, played every major theatre, you know, up to about the sort of two, three thousand seater level theatres through the whole of UK, which was the most fantastic experience, you know, touring in the, you know, the flatliner, in the tour bus, doing the thing, stopping everywhere every day and um, kind of gruelling because we all sleep. There were a lot of people on the bus. There was the band, which was eight and then two or three out, four others and twelve Twelveish people on a bus. You learn how um, how to get along. You know, once again, stressing the idea of relationships and people and staying out of people's hair. And it's, ma- it's amazing how a lot of the players. I'm not really one of these guys, but they're so into coffee. It's a big deal. This whole coffee, talking about it, doing it, drinking it, and all day. <laughs> all day is pretty much the same to me. I'll tell you the movie that I really love for about a million reasons is. Um, Motherless Brooklyn, yes, right, definitely. which is a new one. It is just a fantastic movie. The reason I love it first, I discovered it was because <clears throat> this is quite amazing in this in this day and age. That Tom York, you know Tom York from Radiohead, yeah. he's written the main theme of this movie, and he hasn't done all of the score of the movie, but he's written quite a bit of music for the movie. Um, but Wynton Marsalis has done a version of this tune. Now, this is an incredible combination of people. I keep, you know, every time I speak to anybody, I say, you've got to hear this. And the movie's fantastic. It's a very simple sort of spy, private detective New York movie, but beautifully shot. Um, the story's not that complex or intriguing, but it's just a fantastic thing to watch. You you know, you won't, um, for want of a better phrase, you won't put it down if you start watching it. But the music is just unbelievable. And the tune is called Daily Battles which is kind of like what we deal with. So I'm going to play a little bit of that for you, Pete, now. Thank you, John. play this tune. Yeah, sure. And see if you can feel within it the kind of daily battle concept. That's beautiful, Johnny. Is that a Tom yeah, York? Is that a t- is that a Tom, Tom York? York? It's a Tom York uh, arrangement. He wrote that. It's a Tom York uh, melody, and, melody and you know tune. Yeah. Tom York, York yeah. song actually, Daily Battles. But it just seems to be. It just really struck me that one. It's a fantastic. 
fantastic tune. Does that happen at the end of the film, or does, or is that sort it of? It happens at the start. It happens. The theme sort of repeats within the movie too. Da 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 da. da. And I've just been really taken with it. You know how you get a song in your head and it sticks with you. You know, you wake up in the morning and it's still sort of humming around in your head. It's one of those ones that's really affected me right in this time, um, where every day, I mean. We're getting used to it now, this terrible world uncertainty, but every day you wake up and you go, oh, that's right. You know, that kind of, oh, that's right. There's that thing going on. Yeah. So, yeah, you, yeah. Just can't, you just can't make plans. You just, then you remember, you oh, yeah, we, we, we can't do that because there's that going on, but that's okay. Another project I'm hoping to do at the moment um, is I really want to write for strings because I've written for brass a lot for my own projects and stuff like that. I've never had much opportunity to write for strings, except, you know, through Joe, obviously we wrote strings on two or three of those, uh, I think three of the albums that featured strings where we would use um, string quartets and, and bounce them out to 16 by virtue of moving, you know, that move them around the room, that kind of thing. We got very good results with the strings and I really love writing for strings. And it also kind of led me to, you know, that real highlight when we, when I was conducting the MSO and wrote a whole lot of, you know, some, some compositions and some arrangements of the Van Morrison stuff with Vince and Vicar and Joe, um, that was kind of like a real highlight. And I was wrote, wrote for the whole orchestra at that point. I had a little bit of help with some of the tracks, but a lot of them I did myself, full orchestrations. <clears throat> and I want to write for piano and strings at the moment. That's something I'm looking at. I wrote a, a piece called... Um, it was called Crowned Infected. It was a little bit about a certain world leader and how, you know, the crown had kind of, it was an infected crown anyway that he had. Um, so that's another thing I'm kind of really working. I really like to do that. And getting back to what you say about the job keeper and all that and the world and the world economy, I still feel like a little bit outside that as a troubadour. And I think what worries musicians more than anything is not necessarily, and we've dealt with not making much money at times, you know, all our lives. It's it's not having anything to do, okay? It's not having work to do, having something to create, having something to do, whether that be learn a set of music, write a new thing, write a new set list, um, learn somebody else's stuff, whatever it is, not having something to do is more of a worry for people in the arts community than where's my next buck gonna come from? Because I don't think, I mean, it's all, it's all crazy stuff because I don't think that's a logical way to live, but I think that's the way a lot of artists live is, you know, um, not for money, but, you know, give me something to do. Can you, you know, come and play in my band? Someone's not playing. Oh, what, but your set's a bit kind of, you're doing that um, Cedar Walton thing, you know, and all that kind of involvement and engagement. I think that's Well, really I think it's hard tonight. to pin it down on one particular thing. It gets people down. Human you know? beings are pretty complicated species and, uh, and as you can see with what's going on outside now, you know, with all the panic buying again and all that sort of stuff. So mm. it's, a, it's a very, um, it's, yeah. it's something you, I can't brand and just say that's what it is, you know. I think people will behave, pressure can make people behave in all sorts of ways, you know, and I think that's what happens. If you're dealing, I mean, I don't know, I don't have kids, but if you've got, if I paint you a scenario and you've got three kids running around and you're on the verge of losing your job and there's no and you're 50 years of age and you've gone well I've been in this job for 30 years and there's no yeah. where am I going to pick up a job there's 600,000 people unemployed at the mm -hmm. moment you know so how was it and working with Ross Wilson because you did 10 years with Ross didn't you oh we had a fantastic time um where that started was I asked him to come and play a little jazz gig with me, some the Manchester Lane, one of those gigs way back when. And um, then we sort of got together and he realised that I, would, I could put bands together. So I kind of put people together. I could write charts if necessary or distribute. I'd been done a lot of work in arranging and television kind of work and watched how productions work, whereby you distribute the material and get people in bands. You know what I mean? Like the MD job is my main sort of thing. And I, I kind of learnt that watching people and doing that for ages. So I became Ross's MD at that point. Um, and, you know, he's a brilliant person, Ross. He's kind of very, very, it's very, very interesting, a lot of the stories and a lot of the things. Like, for instance, when you listen to the bass line of Eagle Rock, 
and you realize that it's not just a rock and roll song but it's a rock song and it sets the the precedent for all future rock including up up until like it's sort of like acdc in a weird way this is the bass line it was early you know i mean it was english rock but you know how it's like it's actually Also, Ross loves bass end. So every time we'd ever do a studio recording or something, he'd say, more bass, more bass. So he got me to produce something with him and he was away. And every time I'd send him, he said, more bass. He just wants so much bass. And that was sort of like a bit of a production thing of his success because he, um, you know, the amount of bass, when you listen to Eagle Rock, it's way ahead of its time. It's not just a simple ditty. It's kind of really meaty at the bottom end. And then, of course, you know, at the age of 26, I think it was, he produced all that Skyhook stuff. Incredible. Amazing guy. You know how Sherl had that really fantastic high voice and similar to Ross? You can sort of hear the Ross Wilson influence in it. Not that Ross wrote the tunes, but he wrote a lot of the riffy stuff and a lot of things. We did a show at the Adelaide Cabaret Festival called um, All Smoke and No Mirrors. And that was like we did a bunch of... Um, Skyhook stuff in there, kind of jazzy stuff and stardust and things. And as far as Ross is concerned, he's a, he's a bloody brilliant singer. He's a thorough professional, which really pays off in in this world. You know, the, the really consummate professional part of it, because a lot of a lot of blokes from the wild world of rock and roll don't um, they don't it's probably something I shouldn't really say, but they don't seem to keep that very keep the, their head separate the business and the professional you know what needs to be done and have a very clear picture of what needs to be sorted out and then when they're on stage they, they they're kind of wild performers you know ross has got that fantastic sort of separation of um business and artistic ability and in terms of artistic like really unique way of playing guitar and a really unique way of singing just just the equivalent of um ross hannaford you know, who was also that kind of quirky. Well, I see Ross Wilson's a very similar. I think they were similar. They had a similar development. That just that Ross kind of streamlined himself into a more symmetrical kind of geezer, and Hannaford, you know, kept himself kind of wild hippie, but equivalent in freaky, unique talent. I'd say, yeah. Yeah, because um, when you were talking about uh, Ross's transitioned from uh, Daddy Cool to Skyhooks and then he actually had his own record label which was a subsidiary to Mushroom Records which was called Oz Records. Mm. I, don't, ah. I don't know if you remember mm. that at all and um, he had Joe, it, that's when Joe started with uh, and Ross produced the Falcons first album ah. and, they were, and they were on Ross's uh, record label which is Oz Records which they did about three or four albums with Oz Records, the Falcons. But there was also another band called yeah. the the Runners. Do you remember them? I do. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I think they were on that, and Jane Clifton. I think she was on there. There was a few. Few. He had a few artists that he produced and uh, put their concept together. Mark Gal. Big think. Yeah. Well, he he would have. Been, he's, he was ahead of his time just in terms of production back then. You know. Yeah. Like. Yeah, uh, he could. Uh... Like you said, the uh, Skyhooks album is a way ahead of its time. It still sounds great now. I know. A In lot of amazing stuff on that, a lot of amazing ideas. Went on that, and it's all very Aussie. Yeah. When I met you, I don't know if you remember, I used to mix up the Belgian Bear Garden and Ormond Hall, and I remember you used to come and do those Sunday afternoon. Yeah, sure. Those Sunday, remember those Sunday afternoon shows with Hugh Jam? Yeah, I do. Look, was that like, I thought, I sort of felt like the first time I met you was up at, um, we were playing at Fed Square for some reason, before that even. Yeah, possibly. By Anisha, it was a little Fed Square thing, but that must be, is that 10 years ago? Or more? Eight, yeah, more, more. God have mercy. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, at least you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. But I, I, I remember because uh, one thing I used to find interesting was uh, you'd set up right next to me. 
You'd be at the uh, at the uh, Bel- uh, Belgian beer garden, you know, in the oh, right. uh, yeah, yeah. under that rotunda sort mm. of thing, mm. and um, and some of those Sunday afternoons was so hot, you know, you'd get thirty five degree heat and all that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. and we'd be sweating, mm. but the people yeah. were just pumping, weren't they? It was just like an old rock and roll show, wasn't it? That outside. Well, that's good. Cool. I mean. I'm playing with Eugene Wednesday night at the Cherry Bar, actually, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. That's going to be a live stream thing, and there'll be 20 people there boozing and carrying on, but it won't be that sort of... Yeah, that was an amazing... Um... I don't know how these things happen, you know, where you, you've got the space of the room. You, it's sort of like you can't get a, a promoter or a, a person who's creative with clubs can't create that sort of thing. That creates itself. It does. No, I mean, we used to play, remember, I mean, we had an earlier stage, we used to play inside there and mm-hmm. and then it sort of got too big and then we played outside and, you, you know, you probably were involved in setting up the PA for the outside thing. But, there, yeah, I wish that was still there. That was a great... Oh, it was a great... great it was... It, was it, had, it had great potential, didn't it? Like, I could see the potential in that. Um, yeah. Well, it already it did fulfil its potential. Yeah. The amount of coin that changed oh. hands there is just unbelievable. Yeah. And we used to drink so much of that Who Garden. Remember the Who yeah. Garden beer? Yeah, was, I did. Like, it. It, it just drank itself after a while. It did. Um, it did. That's it. Yeah, that was a scene. That was a real scene. And that was, uh, you know, and I remember just kids coming off the tram, you know, coming through those gates mm. and... Uh, and and I noticed one thing also was um, it would always take him about an hour to rev up, you know, the crowd, you know. You, you'd sort of get the vibe and then you'd get a few people dancing in front of the stage and but, but you could feel this, the energy building. I, that's what I used to yeah. find with it, you know. It was terrific. Was, Eugene's, you know, I mean, he's Australia's greatest entertainer. That's yeah. what we, you know, he's the richest man in the world. We know that. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt having all that incredible. I mean, for a guy who, you know, flies around on Learjets, um, he owns Hamilton Island. You know, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a superstar right there. That's a superstar. That's right. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure. I mean, it, I don't know whether it's, it's old money either. I think it's all been made out of just sheer star quality and, you know, appointments, engagements, sponsorships and everything else. <laughs> you know, but now he owns most of the... All right, let's be honest. We shouldn't really reveal this publicly. He owns most of the world. <laughs> right? And that's, you know, that's just all sheer kind of, I don't know. I mean, he, he had a recent thing. Eugene had a recent, you know, help me buy shoes kind of go fund me thing. And he, he bought a very expensive shoe, pair of shoes. And I don't know why he needed crowdfunding for this, but I think this is part of the way he accumulates wealth is to take it from other people. <laughs> <Yeah. unstrange. laughs> you know, it is a well-known uh, fact that for the many years I worked with Eugene Hamilton that I didn't get paid. No one was paid. Everyone had to pay him a little bit to be able to be profiled with him because playing with Eugene obviously gives you great advantage in the world. And he knew that. Yeah. So basically the guy never gave anybody any money at all and that's why he's managed to keep all of that money. That's I think that's... A smart that thing to do. Sort of logical, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. He's a capitalist. Mm. But he has a, um, a distant relative by the name of David Bowers, who's actually a, a man of great integrity and a very decent <laughs> chap, who painted that picture. Maybe you can just see in the background oh, of the picture yeah, I was, there. I was going to say it's a and beautiful... The, um, that painting is the cover of my... Um, which one? My third album. Uh, Secular. And David Bowers and... Um, He's painted all of the album covers, and he's, you know, he's more the artistic side. He's a distant cousin of Eugene, um, and I don't think they get on very well, you know. Okay. And have you had yeah. to come between the two and, uh, you know? I've had to, I've had to break him up. Break. I mean, Eugene's part of a movement. You don't want to hear what I'm about to say. He's part of a movement called um, Only One Life Matters. <laughs> <laughs> Only one life matters, Eugene Hamilton. <laughs> so yeah, that's sort of pretty much a movement. He asks for a lot of a lot of money goes to that charity. My question about the streaming, my question about where we're going, Pete, is kind of I draw an analogy that that when um, c- photographers came in, photo cameras and photographs came in, which is about 1850s, 1860s, eventually that put the portrait painters out of work. 
and the painters had to adjust their life. And then we know that when the silent movies became talkies, a lot of actors lost the gig because the people who could talk were better, but, you know, like some kept it, some hung in there, some didn't, okay? Then we had Video Killed the Radio Star, whereby in rock and roll was just 45s. We didn't really need to know what they looked like except for the concert. But Elvis Presley was one of the first kind of good-looking sex symbol kind of guys. Before that, it was R&B and black bands and Bill Haley and the Comet. Not to say that they weren't good-looking, but it wasn't that kind of pop star thing that started pretty much with Elvis, Elvis and Bobby Darin and Frank Sinatra to some extent. Then, But people listened to albums. Then video and television. You had to have a look and a, and a thing. So video killed the radio star. And I think we're in one of those. And I can't put my finger on exactly what it is, but it's definitely something to do with that streaming's not going to go away even if the world does go back to its old... Uh, no. up to normal. So streaming won't go away because it's a second-tier economy for clubs and stuff. So it's something... So what that will do to music, you know, because video did a lot, uh, MTV did a lot to music, to the way music sounded and performance, because people would, like, the, the Police is a classic MTV band. You know, look and sound and kind of image. Um, what this streaming thing will do is that you can't just turn up in T-shirts looking lousy unless that's really your look. You know, people are going to have to really think more about the process of a show um, with the visual in mind and the, what do they call that, the, sort of the narrative arc, even if it's a jazz gig, you know, the people have to think more about how it looks. And, you know, for instance, this will change in jazz. You usually just say, we're going to play, um, you know, hand in glove, and we start and play the head, and whoever solo, whoever jumps in solos, you know, that kind of style. Uh, when you're doing, getting into this world, you'll have to say trumpet solo after head, short drum solo, and everything has to be mapped because you're doing because of cameras, and, which you know full well. And, and how, how do you think it's going to affect the punters who are viewing this in terms of, like, traditional groupies and stuff like that? How are they going to, uh, how, you know... I think in terms of um, jazz concerts more than dancing gigs, I can't talk about the dance world is a bit of a problem. People love to dance to funky, groovy bands or even DJs and stuff is another story. So I'm just talking more about your um, concert performance, which is like... You know, Ross Wilson at Bird's Basement, which are kind of their concert shows. Um, it may turn, it may be that <clears throat> um, the live, because of the streaming, the live attendance thing becomes really um, desirable and tickets to live shows skyrocket because less dare to do it. And that's where you really want to be. And almost in a weird way, you become part of the stream. And they might even incorporate that into part of the glamour of paying $350 to go to birds to be part of, you know, might start with um, a New Year's Eve gig, a really expensive because I want to be there kind of thing. Do you know what I'm saying? And that sets a precedent because all the people streaming, put it this way, the Rolling Stones played at birds uh, next week on Monday night. They might get 10 million streams internationally mm. at 10 bucks a throw, right? Yeah. And more importantly, there's no sellout, there's no sold out when it comes to streams. Is no, there? it's whatever. It's whoever taps in. I mean, whether or not the server can uh, maintain mm. that sort of high level of downloading, or you know, that's another thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but that's it's. Your it's well, that's your department, yeah. Peter, but I'm just sort of giving you something. It's interesting to think about. Uh, that well, there's no well, if you've got a big setup. enough, if you've got a, uh, if you, like I've always said, if you've got a big enough profile around the world, that's mm. where the streaming can really benefit you because, again, yeah. you, you, you don't, I mean, you're going to be bigger than any festival. <clears throat> you're mm. going to be big. With the, um, with the Aussie kind of what we call, uh, you know, like a James Rain and Ross and Clapton, John Stevens, those sort of acts, I don't think it suits them to stream because they're used to playing three gigs a week around the country. Now, if people can see them on a stream and it's a successful sort of picture, they don't want to see them at the local pub either. You know, it kind of can wear out the welcome. But anyway, we're, it's a brave new world, Peter, and I'm still, I still haven't got my finger on how this one will change 
the structure of you know what I do or what people do, but we have to think about a different way of. Um, it's a bit like telly performance, and doing an hour's telly is huge. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Telly's like a three minute. We've all done three minutes. So. Yeah. I think we've covered most bases, Peter. We have, Johnny. Thanks for the opportunity, Peter. It's nice to talk to you. I hope we can have a beer in, in the real world. Yes, indeed, enough. John. Yes, thank you very yeah. much for your time. I appreciate it. Kind of get out the uh, Photoshop and make me look much better, okay? Okay, I'll see you, mate. Thank you. See you, bye. bye. You must have cast a spell.